here a little uh, back to COVID-19. And uh, our next speaker, Dr. Caroline Wagner, is an assistant professor uh, from McGill University here in Canada. And she'll be talking to us about accounting for the interactions of immunology, epidemiology, and evolution in COVID-19 mathematical models. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Caroline Wagner, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me today. It's uh, great to be able to present our work. Um, and so, yeah, as you mentioned, I'll talk about some recent stuff we've been doing on COVID-19. Sorry to go back uh, to that topic. Um, and with just in mind that uh, I'm far from considering myself an immunologist, so you'll see that we have immunological concepts worked in, but ultimately we are sort of thinking at the population scale for most of this work. Um, so in general, obviously, and sort of throughout the course of the work as we've, uh, this pandemic, as we've been preparing these various projects, uh, we, we were sort of, and we know that immunology and epidemiology and evolution all interact in the context of disease control. So we thought early on and we've expanded since then to develop sort of a minimal conceptual modeling framework um, to, to think about simulating COVID-19 burden uh, with these interactions in mind. Uh, and so we, we sort of worked through three different steps, which I'll, which I'll touch on briefly here um, at first. And they sort of follow the trajectory of sort of topics of interest as the last uh, 18 months have evolved or so. But uh, at first we we're interested in thinking about the impact of strength and duration of either infection acquired or vaccine acquired immunity um, on uh, sort of our projections for SARS-CoV-2 infection levels and timing in the medium term. Uh, next, we sort of coupled this framework to something to think about evolution in a very simplistic way and think about how dose spacing between vaccine doses might also impact uh, epidemiological trajectories. And, and lastly, we coupled so not only this coupled framework, but then we expanded it into two regions to think about how um, differences in vaccine allocation schemes might, might impact these trajectories. So, uh, as I meant, so the, the, as I mentioned, the most basic framework before we started expanding on it was really just a way for us to to think about how uh, infection acquired immunity or natural immunity may not be lifelong, um, but at the same time, individuals may not return to complete susceptibility. So we built on this framework that uh, Sinead had developed with uh, my postdoc advisor Brian, when she was a grad student, I think Sinead is here today. Uh, so SIR S in, with S in brackets model, which essentially just interpolates between SIR and full SIRS, meaning that um, we can set essentially the, the strength of what a secondary infection looks like in terms of how long immunity lasts following a primary infection and how susceptible an, an individual is who's already had a primary infection and then whose full immunity is weaned. So all we did really was play around with the strength of that <clears throat> protection towards secondary infection and plotted out with, with a bunch of other assumptions that we worked in and parameters what um, it, uh, incidents might look like in the medium term. And just to sort of orient people for these figures since, all, since several of them look like this, the top plots of all these figures represent what we uh, project as being severe cases over time. So these sort of follow a subset of the infection peaks. And then the bottom uh, are known as, we call area plots. So essentially all they show is fraction of the population in each immune or infection category over time. So just quickly going through the first one, for instance, before we simulate the first pandemic peak, everything is gray because everyone is assumed to be susceptible. And then time you see some uh, infection peaks that are either red or light pink for, not for primary or secondary infection, and then the purple colors represent the immune categories. And so what we saw was really just depending on the assumptions we made about how poor or good this immunity was uh, after natural infection, we saw quite different projections in terms of what uh, the burden and timing of cases would be like, say, over a five-year period. Um, we worked vaccination in sort of in the most simplistic way at first, just introducing a vaccination class. And we assumed that again, vaccinal immunity might be imperfect and might wane at a, a rate that might differ from uh, infection and acquired immunity. And again, repeating these exercises, we saw that depending on the assumptions we made for strength and duration, we could see, you know, either essentially elimination after the introduction of, introduction of vaccine or sort of repeated epidemic peaks. Um, and, but in both cases, the introduction of vaccine is obviously very beneficial in terms of reducing the burden of infection. 
So that sort of covered one of the first questions we had. And, and at the time we thought, well, um, you know, vaccines won't be around for a while. So this is sort of just a, uh, an academic exercise at first, but then uh, they came, obviously, as we know, vaccines were introduced amazingly quickly. And then the question became uh, related to spacing between the administration of particularly M mRNA vaccines. So we updated this model to account for not just a vaccinated class, but two vaccinated classes, one having had one dose and two having had uh, two doses, but thinking that some are sort of the immunologic, immunological responses, which in our models manifest as the sort of macroscopic strength of immunity and its duration might differ between the categories. And then once again, we allow for waning um, between the both, both groups, which allows for a reinfection from those states. And this led to a much broader rainbow category of both uh, infection classes and immunity types. And so um, using this, we were able to, again, generate these projections. And what we did now was sort of play around with the spacing between these doses and then make assumptions about how good a single dose relative to two doses was. Because at the time, the question was, how good is the immunity from a single dose? Is it going to be acceptable to vaccinate many people with one dose? Or should we focus immediately on the sort of this recommended um, company the spacing of three to four weeks, what have you. Um, and so what we saw was uh, the administration of the first dose obviously has a big impact on pushing down the magnitude of the first peak, which you see as the first uh, bump in the top, uh, top section of all these panels. But then depending on assumptions we made about how good a first dose was and, was and how good immunity was overall, um, output, outcomes look different moving on uh, down the road. And in particular, what we, what the models and obviously uh, project is that if you follow this strategy of really just immunizing um, with one dose in order to maximize many people, if it turns out that that immunity conferred is less robust, uh, what you can end up in particular with is eventually a large category of people who've had weaned uh, whose immunity from a single dose has waned. And I'll talk about why we thought that might be a category to focus on uh, in a second. So, you know, one thing that we, that we could easily do with the model is just say, okay, instead of always having a strategy of giving one dose or always a strategy of two doses, just switch to, two, so to the sort of the recommended schedule after a certain delay, which we took to be 12 weeks here. And that sort of reflects our, the, uh, the assumption that we had and also what played out of, of supplies increasing over time and sort of the, the benefits of following such a strategy from an epidemiological perspective are, you know, if the single dose immunity were less robust, then you can mitigate that by just following up with the second dose over a time scale that's less, that's shorter than we expect. Um, immunity to wane in the first place. But the, but qualitatively, you see that now these, these images are dominated by more yellow than orange, and yellow reflects uh, waned immunity after two doses instead of one, uh, which was important for the next step that we did, which was to couple this to an epidemiological framework, sorry, an evolutionary framework. So uh, if our immunological model was simple, our evolutionary one is also simple. Uh, so essentially we drew on some, some classical theory that Brian and some of his colleagues had come up uh, with um, a little while ago now, uh, thinking about phylodynamics and sort of uh, adaptation within a single host. And so the, the sort of classical theory, which obviously is more complex in terms of real infections. And we know, for instance, for flu, it's not only relevant about what happens within a host, but it's also relevant to the sort of entire high population level immunity to begin with. But what this the theory says is for a host with essentially no immunity, we expect a lot of viral replication, but without a lot of guidance for evolution one way or another, because there isn't a lot of immune pressure. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, complete immunity doesn't allow for any replication. So we wouldn't expect the virus to, to be able to adapt. And then there might be sort of a sweet spot in the middle where some amount of immunity, partial immunity, um, allows for enough replication with enough sort of guidance from the immune system about what not to do, that that might be a, a point where this at, where adaptation might be maximized. So the idea was to take this frame, uh, framework and then essentially just make some assumptions based on the fact that we didn't know what these values were about where secondary infections would fall on this curve. So this would be infections in hosts who had already seen the virus, whether it was from one or two vaccine doses or from um, natural infection. 
and then you know choose where we fall on the spectrum and then all you have to do is couple the infection uh, time series that we get from our models to these weights for adaptation in order to come up with what, what we're calling sort of a population level of a potential net viral adaptation rate, which we can think about as sort of uh, potentially leading to a scenario uh, for, for antigenic evolution. So it goes without saying that, you know, choosing where these points fall on this curve reflects the uncertainty that we had about these parameters and also will reflect uncertainty in the projections. And so this really does dominate what the projections look like, but overall, we still see that, you know, under certain scenarios, we can expect, you know, far more potential for evolution than others. And, and by and large, obviously, by following strategies that minimize uh, infections, that is also a good strategy to minimize uh, this antigenic evolution potential too, since, if you don't have an infection in the first place, it, it can't take place. So um, that's sort of how we, we coupled these, these two concepts together. So then um, the sort of the latest work that we've been thinking about, we took this framework um, allowing for the multiple dose spacing and we assumed that it's occurring simultaneously in two regions. So we assume that one region uh, is called, the we're calling it the high access region that has um, a sub, uh, all of the stock of vaccines essentially and then there's a low access region and the high access region depends uh, sorry chooses how much of its supply it wants to to provide to the low access region so we have two scenarios that we consider the first assumes complete decoupling between the regions so their epidemiology plays out essentially independently all of the the only coupling that exists is just how much of the vaccines are allocated to the LAR, um, but otherwise they don't interact. And then in the second scenario, we assume that they're coupled either by allowing for immigration of infectious individuals and also by saying, well, we can track this evolutionary rate that I talked about previously, and we can assume that maybe if it reaches a certain threshold, this could simulate some sort of antigenic potential which we could simulate which we can model as a transmission increase in both regions so now we we sort of couple the the evolutionary aspects and the epidemiological aspects in both regions as well as the vaccine share so maybe some of the the simpler results to start with were from the we can take the, the decoupled framework and actually we can do a lot of this analytically we can just look at where the long-term equilibrium lie and plot the uh, Average, uh, average infection burden at equilibrium across uh, both regions. So that's what you're seeing here. It's a bit of a complicated plot as most of them have been, apologies. Um, but we, what we're doing as you move from left to right columns is increasing the strength of immunity, which I talked about before. So that's our assumptions related to the duration of immunity and then sus susceptibility to a secondary infection. The colors represent the vaccination rate. So from red is the lowest vaccination rate to purple is the highest vaccination rate. So you can see very obviously, and this was an important result, that just really increasing the global vaccination rate can really uh, cut down on infections at equilibrium in the first place. And then the rows denote um, the symmetry or asymmetry between the regions. So you know, realistically, it might be possible that one country has an overall higher transmission rate than another. So the, this modeling work is done saying either both regions have the same R0 or beta transmission rate, or one region or the other uh, rate is higher. So what we see with this decoupled framework, and this echoes some classic results uh, for SIR infections, is that on the whole, on the whole, uh, sharing infections either reduces or maintains the number of cases at equilibrium. Uh, when immune responses are stronger, sharing is favored even more, which makes sense because then sort of there's no loss of immunity from the country that's sharing to begin with. Um, and even with uh, symmetry, these concepts of, of sharing are maintained, although where exactly the, the minimum lies uh, might change. And obviously, as I mentioned, uh, having a greater vaccine supply can, can additionally favor, uh, encourage sharing and uh, decrease the expected infection burden at equilibrium. 
So for why this happens, I think it might be more intuitive to look at not just the global burden, but now this is plotting the equilibrium infections in each region. This is assuming a case with asymmetric transmission rates and the low vaccination rate. So what you can see is under these circumstances, as the more vaccines are allocated to the low access region, this is still done at the expense of infections in the high access region. So that curve is growing up while the DOSH curve is growing, going down. Um, but on the other hand, once you increase the vaccination rate, this trade-off doesn't happen anymore. So you can see that there is a large uh, portion where this the high access region curve is just flat because essentially they have enough vaccines to maintain uh, herd immunity. And so really this shows that you can share uh, in this framework, not at the expense of infections in one region. And ultimately that's probably the scenario of the world is moving towards where um, giving vaccines away is not you know, decreasing the number of infections that can be given in the, in the place of giving the, the vaccines away. We can repeat the exercises too with these area plots. Uh, again, we could look at scenarios where with different dose spacings, although at this point with enough vaccine supply, it's likely that, you know, the, the recommended schedule won't be followed uh, more immediately. And again, we can see that by and large, you know, it, it, there is obviously especially with more limited vaccine supply, giving vaccines to the low access region substantially decreases the infections that we see there, although this is done at the expense to a certain level of infections in the high access region. Although you could argue that this is acceptable given sort of the global benefits. Um, but another thing that might not be immediately obvious is that um, depending on the assumptions that we make about how, um, how the fraction of severe cases that might occur upon secondary infection, we see additional benefits from uh, the sharing, which is that um, even if infections occur, secondary infections occur because immunity is imperfect or wanes, if, in, if severe infections are still uh, mitigated, that can be extremely beneficial from a clinical perspective. And, and that requires really immunizing as many people as possible in both regions. So to talk about the coupled results a little bit, um, just showing a little bit of what the curves that we generated looked like. So here we're back, now we're in the world where um, people can move, uh, infected individuals can move between regions. And also we have this, this tracker that keeps track of this net potential viral adaptation rate. And if it reaches a threshold in either country, we assume that a transmission increase might occur uh, in both regions. And so what we did was plot, uh, these are in each curve is internally normalized. So the highest uh, point is one, uh, the cases either severe or total um, across the board or in each region, uh, depending on, again, the fraction of al vaccines allocated between regions for different values of this immigration rate or the reproduction number ratio. So again, that's a reflection of asymmetry between regions. If it's greater than one, so we're in the top region of these curves, that means that um, transmission is higher in the low axis region and, and less than one, um, and vice versa. So uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of this, but uh, what we what I will say is that there are scenarios where um, certain uh, features arise, although it's very much complicated by several assumptions that we make, including, you know, what's the size of each region and, you know, how obviously once we start introducing asymmetries in R0, you can see it's not a clear cut in terms of always having minimization of everything at, at equal sharing. But largely sharing is still um, an advantageous policy across a range of scenarios. And furthermore, there's some interesting cases, for instance, if we look at the top right curve here, PTIs being these potential transmission increases that arise from this high evolutionary pressure in a scenario where there's no sharing. So that's the far right of this curve and high transmission in the low access region. This sort of maximizes the occurrence of these potential transmission events because uh, under this scenario, what we're what the model shows is that repeated infections uh, without vaccination in the low access region will just drive this up this potential net viral adaptation rate that could result in transmission increases globally. So that can, what does that look like sort of in terms of a time series instead of these cumulative sums? 
Well, it shows that if we pick a region's uh, point, so for instance, right now we're at an R naught of a, a ratio of slightly above one, so transmission's a bit higher in the low axis region, but there's no vaccine sharing. Then if we plot the time series of just cases and this, these net viral adaptation rates in both regions, if we were assumed that we're in a world that's completely decoupled, not sharing any vaccines looks quite advantageous for the high axis region in the sense that it has a low total number of infections and none of these um, transmission events because they always stay below this threshold in terms of this adaptation rate. But as soon as you allow for coupling, the, the picture looks quite different because now you have this feedback from letting the infections persist in the other region and it comes at the expense of a much greater number of total infections. And now when we move back on the x-axis and we go to a point of more sharing, uh, you can see that you can actually tamp down the, the global infection number, which, which is obviously an important um, goal. Okay, so the modeling showed that really the burden and timing of COVID-19 infections, the potential for viral adaptation could really strongly be shaped by immune responses following either natural infection or one or two vaccine doses. Um, sharing vaccine surpluses looks like it's advantageous in terms of epidemiology and evolution and sort of supports the need for rapid and equitable vaccine sharing. Obviously, as I showed, uh, it's not super straightforward picture and asymmetries in population size and transmission rates add a lot of complexities, which are particularly marked if, if immune responses are weak. And this is something I touched on before where uh, having weak immunity where this waning is occurring at a rapid scale really clouds this picture because it doesn't make it as straightforward to say, you know, immunizing one region and vaccinating another, but you have this constant competition with waning. Um, and at, lastly, I'll just say that, you know, since you know, regardless of the picture with variants that are emerging, vaccinal immunity does still seem to be quite effective at protecting, protecting against severe infections. This does emphasize sort of the clinical importance of equal distribution. So um, that is sort of what we did in terms of modeling, but early on we were saying, well, like where did, what parameters do we use in this model? And I would argue that we're sort of still uh, saying that. So I'm not gonna go through uh, a lot of the, the details here because yeah, everyone is an expert on immunology here, but early on we sort of said, let's look at other uh, beta coronaviruses to think about you know, how fast this immune waning is happening. So we looked at some of the other uh, human coronaviruses and SARS and MERS and sort of came up, saw some of these estimates ranging from say a, a few months to a couple of years. Now, obviously, and so I will, one plug for our models is that although we choose values for all these values in the paper, um, we have all these interactive applications too, where you, and Sinead made these if she's still on the call, where you can just change, um, scroll through sort of any parameter value that you want for a lot of these immunological parameters and then see how it affects our projections for epidemiology down the road. Obviously now, uh, I would say that there's sort of the, the picture is starting to refine itself a bit and data is becoming available that we want to start incorporating. I'm not going to work through these, but some recent data on uh, immune memory following natural uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and also uh, immunity following uh, mRNA vaccines. Um, and so this is sort of where we're at now in terms of saying, how do we input this data and what does it actually mean in terms of translating to, uh, you know, not just measuring uh, humoral markers, but in terms of actual clinical protection as well. So uh, that's where we are now. So now at McGill, uh, as part of this CANMOD uh, network, I've been working with a couple of people in uh, the public health school on making this a little bit more specific to Canada in terms of thinking about a little more quantitatively to think about uh, COVID-19 burden. So we've taken this model that was already uh, a lot and we've made it a lot, a lot. So now we have uh, more details of natural history. We've got age structure and, and uh, that's maintained in terms of contact rates and transmission rates. And we're factoring in aspects, we're trying to think carefully about immune life history. We're explicitly gonna allow for different variants now and uh, of course keep the concepts related to immune waning. 
So this is uh, very simply, you know, what the model might look like, but just within a single age group. So obviously this is expanded uh, across across many factors now. And this is our great postdoc Etienne who's who's leading this charge. Uh, and then this is sort of what just the infection classes look like. So we want to be able to factor in asymptomatic uh, infections as well, uh, the capacity for uh, testing and isolation. So uh, we're still working on the development side, but what we're hoping is that it'll sort of prevent a present a general enough framework for us to be able to refine it uh, to specific scenarios. Um, in terms of where we're getting the data, we're trying to draw on published data now to feed in. So one example, for instance, is um, through this COVID-19 immunity task force that David and other David Buckridge and others are involved with. We're trying to start feeding in some of this data on seroprevalence into the models. So for instance, we have uh, Helen, who's an undergrad, working on some incorporating data across, you know, right now it's say across different provinces at different time points, we have data about seroprevalence uh, uh, across different uh, subpopulations. So here, just as a disclaimer, this is anti-nucleoplasmid and anti-spike prevalence. So that's why you see it shoot up around March, 2021. This isn't infections, this is vaccination. So also for us to be able to distinguish between these and then use it to parameterize our models will be a big step moving forward and, and starting to get some of these data stratified by age, but obviously this isn't a complete um, set just yet. That's really what I wanted to say. Um, sorry if I've talked too much. So the mo our models sort of demonstrate the strength that you know these mean parameters are really important. And while I'm far from an immunologist, I think working on the figuring out the right way to to work them into the models is something we're very interested in doing, uh, especially as these data become more available. And I guess one thing that we're identifying are big remaining unknowns that our models are sensitive to, um, or particularly in these evolution contexts. You know, when will variants occur? What will immunity look like towards new variants? So questions might be like what subpopulations is selection occurring in and then we really need to be able to better characterize breakthrough infections and how they're sensitive to life history so whether the person has had natural infection plus one dose or you know which vaccine etc cetera, etc cetera. so just to highlight all the work on COVID was done with Brian and, and Chatty sort of as the main leaders of this charge with a bunch of other colleagues and then these are collaborators from McGill and I'm happy to answer any questions Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, you may ask, or you might want to, if you like, you can also type in uh, questions into the chat box as well. So while waiting, uh, Carolyn, it's really interesting to uh, to see the results uh, comparing, you know, high access region to low access region. Uh, so I have a question, sort of from a policy point of view. I, I know Canada, we we are now um, we have promised a number of vaccine uh, to be donated to uh, countries that have low access region. So. Does any of your results uh, that you have published uh, fit into that policy? Or are you in contact with people at ISAT and Health Canada for this? Yeah, I haven't been in contact specifically for Canada. We've been talking to the WHO pretty consistently overall, but obviously this is working out to be a very country specific problem. Um, but I think the models, I think as I was saying, you know, our models really assumed a scenario of limited supply always and in some ways as i was saying that's not what we're experiencing anymore we're almost in a in a scenario of sufficient or oversupply that we can now distribute so we think if anything uh, that'll sort of enhance the predictions that our models show in terms of the impacts it will have um, but and then one thing we didn't really look at with the model uh, which is another caveat is this sort of sequential allocation which we're seeing our models sort of assume that the sharing happens from the get-go. So it is sort of a slightly different scenario that we'd have to model a little bit more carefully to say, okay, wait till high access region has a certain vaccination rate and then start administering or something like that. I think um, the qualitatively things will hold through, but that's not a scenario that we did explicitly cover. There's a question on the chat from Peter. Um, could you explain how you input the evolutionary dynamics of the virus into the yeah. epi model? Yeah, is yeah. it inside the infection rates? 
Yep. For sure. So it just tracks like the model outputs infection in all these different immune classes um, over time. So, you know, that's uh, secondary infection after natural infection, secondary infection after one vaccine, two vaccines. So we have all those curves, right? And so then what this very simple evolutionary model does is it says um, this net potential for viral evolution de depends on the, the presence of infections in these classes. We assume it's not primary infections, because those people would have no immunity, but these secondary infections. So then all we do is assign weights that follow that sort of qualitative para parabolic curve that I showed, where each, you know, each of these secondary infection classes has an associated weight. And then we're really just summing up, you know, the number of infections in that class times that weight, plus the number of infections in another class times that weight. And then that gives us this net pressure over time, which we say, you know, we can set a threshold then if it gets too high, maybe an antigenic evolutionary event might occur. So that's really focusing only on, you know, within a host potential for, for these evolutionary events to occur, which as I mentioned, we know is a simplification compared to our understanding of this being a more population level phenomenon. All right, thank you so much, Caroline. And, you know, again, I really appreciate you taking the time and effort to, to come and present your work to us. Thank you, Thanks Carol. For having me.